Okay, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Peter Cole. I am the MSU Extension Forestry Specialist. Um, I'm housed here at the University of Montana where I'm adjunct faculty and I'm an Associate Professor of Forest Ecology and Management, um, partly because I have background in both. Um, my, my graduate work, etc., was really in uh, tree plant physiology and ecology, uh, biophysics, uh, but my background was in applied forestry. And what I find is we have a lot of interesting research that's done at a basic level, uh, but often the connection to how does this uh, help, what does this mean towards applied forest management is not made. So this is kind of what I like to do and have been involved with. And I've been lucky enough to work in the Northern Rockies for more than the last 30 years. I'm originally from Wisconsin and went to Michigan State University for my undergraduate and then worked for the Wisconsin DNR for a year before I moved up to Idaho. And uh, so the Northern Rockies really has been uh, my home for more than 30 years and uh, I feel very fortunate, but also um, honestly, either I'm a slow learner or it's a really complicated system, it takes a long time to really understand how these systems work out here. Uh, they're, they're pretty complex and a lot of stuff going on on them. So I'm kind of presenting it from, from that background. And uh, several months ago, uh, Vinny Carrell, the, the uh, owner of Northwest uh, Forest Management, one of the largest consulting firms, um, and he, he called me up and asked me whether I'd do a, a topic on the question of uh, drought impact for the uh, Northern Foresters Forum, which is a continuing ed workshop he does for professional foresters every January over in Coeur d'Alene. And uh, yeah, right off the top of my head, well, yeah, this is kind of up my alley, so yeah, I'd be glad to do that. And the more I got into this, I started thinking, boy, what did I agree to here? Because, uh, you know, water cycles and drought and climate and tree physiology mixed together makes for a pretty uh, complicated uh, uh, soup. And um, anyways, so hopefully I've achieved my objective. We're, we're going to start with kind of a big picture and then end with uh, hopefully some applied practical information that all of us can um, think about at least as we're managing our own forest uh, woodlots, etc. So water is everything across the northern Rockies. Um, this is northwest Montana, lush, dense forest, uh, pretty productive, um, is, a, is a prime example. Um, and I, I'd say water is everything because we only have to move a couple hundred miles to the east in the same latitude, and uh, we're in that, um, which is you know similarly uh, complex topography, but we're looking at 8, 12, or 11, 12 inches of annual precipitation here, whereas in the previous picture we're in varying anywhere from 20 to 40 inches of precipitation a year, and so the question is okay so. What's happening with drought? Um, if you follow any of the climate change literature and, and publications and, and popular articles, uh, there are some that would say that uh, northern Rockies might look like this in 100 years. Um, and, and of course, everything else in between. And so the science of climatic variability, climate change, whatever you want to call it, has come an awful long ways, but it's an incredibly complex topic. And so I'm going to kind of overview some of the things that are involved with this. Um, and I you know, throw this one in here. This is a Dearborn River between uh, Lincoln and, and Great Falls one, one morning as I happen to be driving by. It really demonstrates how important water is and how much it impacts vegetation across the landscape, um, you know, where you have a, a sort of consistent water supply and, and then very rapidly transition to 11 inches of annual precipitation. So. <clears throat> When I get on um, the official Forest Service Climate Hub uh, and their most recent uh, publication on climate impacts and climate change and what we can expect, and this uh, uh, one also somewhat looked at the north northwestern United States too, uh, this is, these are the recommendations I got off of there. Uh, so one, drought projections suggest that some regions of the U.S. will become drier and that most will have more extreme variations in precipitation. Um, two, if current drought patterns remain unchanged, warmer temperatures will amplify drought effects. Three, drought and warmer temperatures may increase risks of large-scale insect outbreaks and larger wildfires, especially in the western United States. Uh, certainly we've all seen these types of phenomenon occurring. 
Uh, four, drought and warmer temperature may accelerate tree and shrub death, changing habitats and ecosystems in favor of drought tolerant species. Uh, five, forest based products and values such as timber, water, habitat, and recreation opportunities may be negatively impacted. Uh, and, and six, forest and rangeland managers can mitigate some of these impacts and build resiliency in forests through appropriate management actions. So um, there you have the meat of it. And with that, um, I, I can just say, okay, we're done, and you can go have a cup of coffee. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, things we read in the publications and presentations that come out uh, give us these kind of generic things that we can sort of identify with. But as the individual forest landowner, um, it kind of leaves me wanting more or something specific because yeah I've seen all that stuff but you know it's kind of like a doctor telling me at a doctor visit yeah you're okay but eventually you're gonna die well duh okay I know that um, so let's get into the how and whys of all of this um, certainly last summer was a pretty scary summer in the 30 years that I have been here uh, we've seen some pretty dry years um, but I don't think we've ever seen our, river, our rivers and, and some drainages get as dry as they have been. I mean, the St. Regis River almost completely dried up. It was just potholes and it went uh, uh, below, below the surface in the cobbles, you know, which has significant impacts on, on the fisheries, but it's an indicator of what's been happening on the landscape. And uh, in discussions uh, that we had uh, last year, um, as we we had uh, an extremely early snow melt from mid elevation. Now we have snow tell sites across Montana. These are high elevation snowpack measurements that in the end of January last year, because I tracked this stuff, I showed we're at 120% of normal snowpack, which everybody said, oh, you're fine. We got all the snow up there, 20% more than normal. But a lot of us were looking at the mid elevation sites that were just like now had no snow on them anymore. And just this last week, I was on a friend's property where normally this time of year, there's three feet of compacted snow uh, and there's none. I drove it with my pickup and walked around out there. And uh, that's a little scary. Um, and I also track a long-term uh, climate and weather forecast uh, put out by NOAA. And um, right now, we are poised for a summer that is at least as bad as last year, if not worse. And I'll elaborate on that. Uh, uh, more throughout this section. So it's kind of a scary proposition and considering that I was pretty worried last summer and I've been around fires for a long time and I was never as worried as it was last summer. Um, things are going to happen. Now when I'm asked uh, what is the long-term impact or what's the impact of drought and these, these weather patterns that we're having uh, across the northern Rockies of the forests, well uh, it you, to be honest, the first thing you come up with, well, it depends. Because as we look across this landscape with uh, Arley Valley, Mission Valley behind there, forestry and forest management is site specific. Uh, I mean, that's the, the mantra that I tell all the students here because we tend to develop these landscape level prescriptions, uh, whole scale solutions of how to manage and, and work with our forests when the reality, uh, particularly the Northern Rockies, um, What's going on right here is going to be very different than what's going on right here and very different than what's going on right over here. And so really everything here has to be site specific. And because it hasn't been in some cases, we've seen some real failures out there. And uh, for the individual forest manager, it gets frustrating because we get these generic uh, prescriptions that we might try and implement on our property. And uh, it, it comes down to uh, my definition of multitasking, which is doing everything equally poorly, okay? And that's where some of this generic stuff comes along. So uh, I'm going to start with a big picture and hopefully we'll get down to some specific things that you can look at on, on, on your property. So as I got to thinking about this topic, uh, what's the impacts of drought on Northern Rockies, um, I had to kind of uh, um, compartmentalize in my own brain of how to tackle something uh, so so diverse. And so now here's the Highwood Mountains in central Montana that really epitomize some of the diversity we have out here. And I just happened to be out doing some windbreak work and found out rocky outcropping that I climbed up on. And here's this little uh, limber pine that seed managed to fall on a crack in the rock and grow out there in the middle of nowhere. 
um, where it might not be, but you know, impacts of drought that really came to mind. Um, and of course, that little limber pine, that uh, one bull elk that happened to be making a, uh, a, a uh, immigration across Montana happened to find that and beat the crap out of it in the middle of nowhere. Um, but uh, so a, a pretty good backdrop. Um, so when we look at this, uh, number one, um, overall weather patterns and climate uh, impact what vegetation and what the impacts are on forests, okay? Uh, so does anybody know what the difference between weather and climate is? Okay. Weather is short term and climate is long. Right. So the accepted way of bracketing that is weather anything that happens in a 30 year period. And climate is a 30 year or longer trend. Okay, and we, inter we use those and our media and everybody interchanges those a lot, but uh, how does summer ever indicate in climate change, okay? Well, climate change is only indicated by a 30 year or longer trend that we're in, okay? It doesn't mean it's not happening, and I'll show you uh, data uh, that gives some more uh, information on that, but weather is really what's happening now, what's happening this season, what's happening this year, what happened last year, types of things. Two. <coughs> Well, that weather and uh, climate interacts uh, with the mountains that we have out here and the valleys. Uh, and again, very evident by you have forests on the mountain range back there and you don't have forest in the front. Um, so topographic position and soils. I mean, soil is a moderator of things. And again, I'll get into all of these in greater detail. Within that landscape, on that uh, variability of topographic position and climate and all of that stuff, we have different species. Um, so, for example, it's not, uh, it's not a coincidence that limber pine is growing right here versus grand fir or Douglas fir or even ponderosa pine, okay? <coughs> limber pine is uniquely adapted to grow on hot, dry sites with high wind and, and, and so it's, it's there because it has the adaptability to grow on that site. But within a population, there's also a lot of genetic variability. Just like in this room, there are some of us that don't have hair and some of us that do have hair. Well, in a population of Douglas fir, you have a, a wide range of genetic controls that are there that uh, might predispose some Douglas fir to fungal infections in wet years and other Douglas fir to Douglas fir beetle in dry years. Okay, there, there's differences in physiology. And they're not all in one tree or the other, it depends which trend you happen to be in. But you know, there's this thing called genetic selection that goes on that trees that have the genetics that uh, make them a little weaker on a particular site to a certain particular set of circumstances tends to eliminate them by killing them and they're not producing seed and passing those genetics on. So, you know, certainly that's something we have to consider in all of this. And then finally, um, there's another component to all of this uh, that I'll let you think about and hopefully will be answered towards the end of this presentation um, that plays into all of this. So uh, if we start with some real basic uh, uh, physics and physiology of how trees work and why they work out here, and you know how does the hydrologic balance work with them? So of course we get our precipitation, our moisture through rain or snow, okay? And uh, that either um, will land on the canopy of trees or fall in between. And it's a very important phenomenon because uh, the way our summer rain often is, it's a short-term event that dumps some moisture anywhere from a tenth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. And you may have all noticed that after a rainstorm like that, um, underneath the trees is kind of a ring of dry soil, and out more in the meadow it's wetter. And so canopies can have a huge impact, uh, particularly on those types of events. Uh, but they also have an impact on snowpack. Um, you know, a snowpack is something I've been monitoring for a long time, and there's actually some significant research on snowpacks. Um, so snow that lands on a canopy, uh, on a canopy of a tree and gets intercepted, almost never melts or makes it to the soil. Some of it does, you get a wind and knocks it out of there, but most of it evaporates right back into the air. Okay, and I always tell the example, uh, uh, end of November when I go out chasing elk up in the mountains, there's a specific spot I go to that has gated roads on it, and everybody parks by the gate, and they tromp through three feet of snow on the road. And I go a quarter mile up in the trees, and I'm only in six inches of snow. And so I'm five miles down, down the ridge when the people tromping down the road are only half a mile down the road because they're pushing three feet of snow. And, you know, I've had cases where my brother went, went on the road, and I went the other way, and 
I'd been hunting for two hours. I was sitting down eating lunch when he came perspiring heavily around the corner and said, how the heck did you get here? Okay. Uh, so, you know, th there's a huge impact that you, that you will see even just in walking around in your forested <laughs> property. And, you know, so interception and evaporation is, is a big process that goes on. And the denser the tree canopy, the more is intercepted, the more evaporates. Well, then we have uh, the stuff that makes it through. There's a whole thing going on there, too. Because what it lands on is really important. Uh, does it get absorbed in the soil or does it evaporate right back in the atmosphere? So an opening like this in the middle of summer, the soil surface temperature may be 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And you get a tenth of an inch rainfall on that, well, it just evaporates off of there like off of a big frying pan. And it doesn't make it in the soil. Versus, uh, say, this time of year, the rain we're having right now lands on the soil. Well, the weird phenomenon we're in now is it's cold at night in the 20s and it's warm during the day. So right now, this rain and the snow that melts is landing on frozen soil and it runs off in the surface in the creek bottoms and it doesn't get into the soil and recharge that soil reservoir. So there's lots of stuff going on right there. Uh, and of course, it evaporates off uh, your soil surface. Is it compacted? Uh, is it porous enough to absorb moisture? Uh, we see this uh, woody debris on the ground, uh, which I've also studied a fair amount. And that woody debris can actually, in the summer, intercept rain. The rain hangs up in there. And it gets hot because it doesn't uh, have any kind of thermal conductivity to it. And so where we often think of that as keeping the moisture in the ground, which it does, but it can also keep the moisture from getting into the ground under the right circumstances. So there's all these trade-off phenomena on there. Well, then the tree itself. I mean, for trees to <laughs> physiologically function, respire photosynthesis, uh, they have little pores called stomates in their needles through which they absorb carbon dioxide. Okay. Well, carbon dioxide is about a third bigger molecule than water, which means whenever your humidity is less than 100%, and commonly 30% here in the summer when these trees are actively growing, trees lose water uh, at a rate 30 to 40 times greater than they absorb carbon dioxide which means uh, they're just blowing water like mad uh, to be physiologically active. And for example, a cottonwood tree that has no control over its physiology, a uh, mature cottonwood tree may uh, lose 200 gallons of water a day when the humidity is down to 30%. Okay, uh, So that's a lot of water going out that way as well. Uh, Ponderosa pine has this unique ability to control its pores. So as soon as the humidity drops down to a certain threshold where it's losing water too fast, it shuts its pores and that's how it conserves water and survives on these dry sites. So there, there's all those things to take into account. Well, then there's also growth. Water gets converted into other uh, biochemical um, substances as part of overall growth, uh, respiration, photosynthesis in the tree, and so it gets captured in the wood. And overwhelmingly, sun and the fluctuations on the sun's temperature have a huge influence on this, as we're uh, seeing now. Or in the summer, you know, how much water gets dried out, I mean, how much sunlight is available for the trees to use. Um, temperature has this impact on humidity. The warmer the air, the greater its capacity to hold water. So during the day, in the morning, we're at dew point, 100% humidity, and that's why the water falls out of the air and deposits itself on the grass. By midday, as the air warms, its capacity to absorb water increases uh, geometrically. And so by mid-afternoon, when we're at 80 degrees, the relative humidity might be down to 20%. And so the suction of dry air on any wet surface at that kind of 20, 30% relative humidity is almost 200 pounds per square inch. So water gets pulled out of stuff at a phenomenal rate. So you know, really the sun and the temperature are huge uh, players in this rain-snow interchange. And then finally, wind. For every five to 10 mile hour mile per hour increase in wind speed, uh, actually the transpiration evaporation rate can double or triple. So when it's windy out, things lose moisture a lot faster. And you know, if anybody ever hangs their wet clothes on a branch or on a laundry line anymore, and it's windy out, you know, it's dry almost instantly. Um, whereas in, in still wind. So, you know, these are just the basic components of how the physics of all of this uh, hydrological cycle interacts. And so you're asking, well, how bad is the drought? Well, it depends on the tree you have, where you are on the landscape, uh, what's the wind like, what's the temperature like, uh, how deep is the soil? It's complicated. And, and so that's, I mean, just to, to kind of give you an overview. 
and so this is how we would diagram it out, you know, in, in, the, in, in the physics. This is the slide I started out with, and I thought, no, that's not, not going to work. But uh, just, you know, we can quantify this stuff uh, uh, mathematically as well. All right, so to start with the big picture then in this whole thing, climate. So weather patterns, climate, um, and what, the way we model weather nowadays is called through general circulation models. Uh, which started with, you know, this basic known concept of how air and, uh, circulates on, on the globe. And this has been known for four or five hundred years. These are called the trade winds. So when Columbus or way back when the Europeans wanted to make it to North America, they'd head south to the Azores and uh, catch, with their sailing ship, they'd catch these southerly trades over to the Caribbean. And then they'd go up the coast. And when they wanted to go home, they head north, and they catch the north trade winds back to England, and, and head south if they were were the Spanish. Um, and it's the same things going on uh, in the Pacific, etc. And so these are pretty constant things uh, based on how the Earth spins and the warming of the atmosphere and all of that. And so we can model uh, how much moisture is in these and what the heat capacity is. And this is where the greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases come into play because if you have a lot of carbon dioxide in those air masses, they trap the heat a lot more. And so how does that heat dissipate across uh, the globe? And these are called the, the general circulation models. Now, I, I used to work on these a little bit um, when I was doing a postdoc uh, in, in, in truth, uh, truthing these, how accurate they are. All of these models, uh, the general circulation models, are wonderful what are called relative models. That means we have inputs that drive this. So if we input sun's energy, and we input the ocean temperature, uh, and we input the interaction between low pressures and high pressures, and we tweak one of them, we can see how it impacts the other ones. Okay, it's a relative model. They're terrible absolute models. Okay, an absolute model is that we throw in all this data, and we use it to predict what's going to happen 5, 10, 20 years from now. Okay? Um, and that's partly because these systems are much more complicated than the main drivers we put into them. If you just look at, the, think of that tree and all the things going on there, uh, it's what are our main drivers, but one minor thing in there, change in soil depth, can throw the whole thing off. Which is why similar models, the, the biogeochemical cycle models, BGC models, are what are used to determine your tax rate on your forested land. Okay? Your forested land is taxed based on its potential to grow trees, which is determined by the amount of sunlight you get, your average growing season, your average precipitation. That, and uh, the Montana uh, legislature adopted that at, for their basic tax calculations about 20 years ago as these models became uh, a little bit more robust. And our Steve Running here is the one who developed those along with his graduate students and postdocs. The problem is, though, after 10 years, when we actually start, uh, people start ground truthing them, they found the models were horrible, less than 60% accurate. And they started uh, saying, now wait a second, you're taxing me for something that, I'm not cap that my land isn't capable of doing. So 10 years ago, a committee was established and they now um, um, calibrate those models with what's called site index. It's actual tree height growth on a particular site. And once you calibrate the model, then in relative terms, it, it works okay. Okay, but built into that is if you know you feel that you're being taxed at a tree growth rate that your property isn't really showing, you can measure your trees and you can go to the Department of Revenue and you can say, hey, this isn't right. Now, is it worth your time? Our forest land taxes are pretty darn low in Montana. So if you want to change your per acre tax rate from five uh, to four dollars per year, and you think of the time and effort you're going to put into that. Plus, the Department of Revenue has this nasty habit of ignoring you when you want to do something. <laughs> I mean, when, I, when we changed the, pro the tax status on our forest land, it took us almost two years to get it through. In the meantime, I had to pay a super high tax that wasn't fair. But, and they eventually refunded me. But you know, as you know, if you're late, they immediately charge interest. If they're late, you get no interest. So anyways, uh, off, off, off topic a little bit. But, so this is kind of how these circulation models are used for predicting weather patterns. And so uh, this is kind of uh, uh, what's used in, in some of these um, diagrams that we create, as, long as, as well as we now have tremendous satellites out there, the Aqua and Terra satellites that monitor these things. So almost everybody's heard of El Nino, where the equatorial Pacific water is, is on the warm phase, and La Nina, where it's on the cool phase, 
And this uh, expression came from uh, the Chilean fishermen that when the water's cold, it holds more oxygen, supports better life. Uh, so fishing was good when the Pacific was cold. And when the Pacific was warm, uh, El Nino, uh, the fishing was terrible because the warm water doesn't hold the oxygen and the fish go away. Uh, so that's where that name came from. Uh, so some of the popular articles and news reporting here is we're in a super El Nino. Uh, but if, again, you look at the historical record, from 1960 till now, we, we've had three super El Ninos. About every 20 years, we have a super El Nino. Okay, so this is part of, of how these things work, and let's throw that out there. So here's a more uh, 2015 picture of so surface temperature determined by satellites, as well as buoys and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and there's all sorts of things that play into this. Ocean currents, we always have this cold spot off of Nova Scotia up here, and that's supposedly because of an upwelling of a deep ocean current, uh, at least according to Michael Mann, who's one of the primary physicists who's modeled all this stuff. Um, so this is these big bodies of water. Uh, water doesn't change its temperature very easily. It, it buffers. It takes a lot of energy to change water by one degree Fahrenheit or centigrade. So it's this big buffer that's out there. And it's really the oceans uh, have been determined to be the major determinants of, of um, weather patterns and climate on the continents, perhaps with the exception if you're in central Siberia, um, you're far enough away that the land mass also has a pretty big influence on things. Uh, so if we look at how that actually impacts us in the Northwest, uh, with the super El Nino, which is warm, which supports a high pressure, that high pressure circulates clockwise, and high pressures always feed into low pressures, which circulate counterclockwise. And that, uh, that those two things uh, combined basically pull warm air off of California and Nevada up across Montana. And this is why last summer we, you know, we had a, a, a mild winter, uh, a warm spring, warm summer, and that's how this air circulates based on these low and high pressures off of there. Uh, so um, now when uh, NOAA models all this stuff, and they've gotten pretty good, they've been doing this for a long time, and I've been tracking it for a long time, but the last five or six years I found that their predictions have been pretty good. And so what they're predicting here is, uh, here we are in February, and this is uh, uh, the El Nino, and they're expecting the El Nino to slowly phase out and potentially even transition into a La Nina uh, sometime uh, middle of, of, of next winter or so. Now what these little squiggly bars are in here, this is error, there's, there's multiple models, okay? There's not one model that does this well. So there's multiple models that different scientists have developed and each of them claim, of course, that their model is the only true model. <laughs> so if you run it through all those different models, you get this spread of potential impacts. So we still may be in an El Nino, if you follow that model predictions, or we may be in a La Nina. Um, and so you go after off of the majority of what the predictions are. And so the majority of the predictions are we're gonna be neutral. Uh, which is uh, scientific language for we have no clue what's going to happen, okay? <laughs> so, um, but there you go. I mean, that's, that's kind of some of the latest analysis uh, as of January uh, that came out on this. Now, El Nino and La Nina <clears throat> are equatorial water, okay? And they have an impact on us because of how they impact the position of low and high pressures. Uh, what really impacts us in Montana and the north, northwestern United States is what's called Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And that's the temperature in the Northern Pacific that you know, will support that lower, that high pressure, and I'll give you a little bit more explanation on that. But a couple things. Uh, this is uh, the last 100 years of measurements, temperature measurements uh, that are equated to uh, uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So these are warm periods, these are cool periods. Um, and so the first thing I wanna present is we always show climate or even weather and shorter trends within 30 years as this average, this black line in here, okay? Now, I wanna make the point that averages are extremely misleading because in an ecological sense, what makes a difference are the extremes, the extreme hot and the extreme cold. So when it's extremely hot out, all the grand fur that has crept out of the riparian areas during cool or wetter period on this hot dry site goes into water stress, it gets air embolisms and xylem, and fur engraver beetle kills it. Okay, I see this happening on my own property. 
Okay. And so this is where Grand Cru gets hammered back. When you're at extreme colds, um, I work with windbreaks and shelter belts. All those os trees that people have planted out in central Montana that grow 10 feet a year and throw three years, hey, I got a 30 foot tall tree. And these extreme colds, they all die. Okay? Because they can't handle cold temperature like that. They don't have the mechanisms to deal with it. So it's the extremes that determine species distribution as well as species performance out there. And so, for example, if you take uh, 1970, well, the average says we were abnormally cool wet, okay? We had a hot spike that summer, and we had fires, and we had trees dies, and we had bark beetles attacking trees, okay? So really, the, what's going on, you have to look at the details in there, and always be very, very careful when you look at averages out there, because they don't, they're, they're not, well, they, they follow my definition of multitasking, which is doing everything equally poorly, okay? Uh, so it, it shows a trend, so that this, is, this is the climate trend, but it's the actual weather that makes the differences of what's going on out there. And so uh, some things to look at. Um, what I want to point out here is this 1940s to mid-1970s stretch, which is actually, I think I have, whoop, let me go back. I'll stop. Well, I'll go on. I'll go back to that one. If we look at the 350-year reconstruction of Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, we see that this stretch was the longest cool wet stretch in the last 350 years. Okay. Now, that is important if you're a tree, uh, a forest, where seedling survival depends on a wet spring, a wet summer, combined with a good seed crop, low rodent population, and low competition. Okay. So hot, dry periods, tree seedlings die off. Cool, wet periods, tree seedlings survive. And after they survive that first year, they're a lot more robust. They have a root system down. They can find water, and they can survive. So you know, we often talk about this period in here where we didn't see all the forest fires, and they didn't reappear until the 1980s. Well, yeah, of course. It was cool, wet during that period of time. So fighting fires was pretty darn easy, and there weren't as many of them. And when it gets hot and dry, then, well, and, and this, things grow like that. You know, grasses, vegetation, brush, trees invade places where they shouldn't go. And then we go into this hot, dry phase, and stuff starts to die. You have a high fuel loading, um, and those ignitions blow up into mega fires within the first two hours, and you can't suppress them so easily anymore. So, and indeed, when I looked at uh, uh, separate data sets, I kind of compiled bad fire years. Uh, now, a bad fire year in 1823 or 1833 is called a bad fire year <clears throat> because based on fire scar analysis on trees in western Washington and Oregon and eastern Washington and Oregon and Nevada and Idaho and Montana, in 1833, there's a lot of trees that have fire scars, which means the northwest was on fire and therefore we called a bad fire year. Okay, So when I put those on and um, onto this Pacific Decadal Oscillation, uh, graph, you can see that what becomes common sense is that when you're in a hot, dry period, things burn. And when you're in a cool, wet period, things don't burn. And particularly when you're in a long, hot, dry period, things burn more often and more severe because there's a lag defect or effect, a delay effect. One soft, dry summer isn't enough to deplete soil water resources. Two dry summers starts to get there. Three dry summers, and everything is bone dry. And on top of that, conifer trees, as a physiological mechanism to deal with drought, produce more pitch, more terpenes, which are highly flammable. So a drought stress tree, think about the Christmas tree that you put inside, OK? That Christmas tree doesn't know it's dead. You just cut its roots off. It's just not getting enough water. So even the physiology in that Christmas tree is changing. That's why it smells so nice. It's given off these chemicals that are in part uh, mechanisms to slow down water loss. But a dried out tree is much more <coughs> flammable because of that chemical change than a fully hydrated tree. So these are cumulative effects. The longer the dry period, the worse the impacts, uh, uh, et cetera. Oh, let me, and I said I was going to go back. Okay. So I, Sorry. There we go. So what is Pacific Decadal Oscillation? Well, as I mentioned, it's North Pacific. 
Okay, and so here is, this is El Nino La Nina down here. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is whether the Northern Pacific is cold or warm. If it's cold, it supports a low pressure. Okay, and a low pressure circulates counterclockwise. And when that movement hits the coast, what it does is it pulls that California, Nevada air up into Montana. So when the Northern Pacific is cold, we are warm and dry. And likewise, when the Northern Pacific is warm, it supports a high pressure which circulates clockwise, and that tends to pull air down from Alaska, Canada into Montana, and we're cold and wet. And that's why, it, well, back up, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation operates independently from El Nino La Nina, okay? Typically, it's opposite. So when the equatorial waters are warm, the North Pacific waters are cold. And so our, and when um, that high pressure here circulates this cold air, so when California typically is wet and cool in the summer, we're hot and dry. And when California is warm and dry, we're cool and wet. Except on weird years or weird cycles, like we're in now, where both are happening. Not only uh, are we, this cool wet and this low pressure is pushed so far north that we're that that Canada is getting it, but we're not. Okay, and so this high pressure, right? This uh, um, high pressure down here is actually still forcing warm air up from California to us. So, and this isn't this isn't the normal average. Okay, this is considered an abnormality when the two are in sync. So, and that might explain why we're seeing what we're seeing. Yes. Is it a case that La Nina or El Nino is pushing that further north? You say they're separated, but just well, influence the other? We have high pressures and low pressures, and they're kind of opposite each other. One feeds the other. Okay, the high pressure circulates clockwise, and it feeds. Well, let me go. The, it feeds into the counterclockwise of the low pressure. But it's a question of how big that high pressure is. And with the super El Nino, we've had a mega high pressure here. Okay, and that so that low pressure that normally. Um, would play up there is feeding, we're not getting all that cold air, what we're getting is the fringe, and that low pressure is feeding this high pressure air right into us. Okay, and that's why predictions for last year by NOAA is they didn't know for Montana. We were right between that high pressure and the low pressure. And it all depended how far that high pressure moved north or how far it moved south. And unfortunately for us, it moved north. And so we got more of that, that warm air hitting us. So, and Granted, this is a little bit simplistic, uh, but you know this is really how it works. I mean, there's all sorts of, uh, just like in a stream, there's all sorts of little eddies and, and weird stuff. And we also have the Arctic Oscillation that plays into it from the North Pole that affects us. So it, it's all interconnected in how it feeds itself. All right. So um, when we think about you know these long-term trends of things that happen. Um, W.H. Culver was a surveyor uh, in, in the uh, development of the West, and he also carried with him one of these enormous cameras, and he took <coughs> pictures of things. Uh, so these, is a, these are the Judith Mountains outside of uh, Lewistown, Montana, and uh, kind of showing the landscape, and you have this nice rock outcropping here as a reference point. Uh, so I, I throw this one out there, and there, there are many others that show the same kind of trends out here. And you know, I look at that mountainside, and I ask most people, is that a grassland with some trees, or is that a forest with some grass on it? And you know, most of them would say, yeah, it's a grassland with some trees. Um, but now we move 100 years into the future of 1988. And remember, keep your eyes on those rocks. There's the rocks again. So there's our mountainside again now. Okay. And so I would uh, say that's more of a forest with some grass on it now. And you know, this trend is, is uh, consistent all across the Northern Rockies, Idaho, Montana. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of historic photo guides. I have, I've collected all of them and I go through them. And you see the same phenomenon out there. And so early on when this first came out, these pictures were, was proof that, look what impacts fire suppression has had. Well, um, it's, you know, fire suppression alone doesn't do this. You know, there's, there's some impacts of fire suppression. But the reality is this is a phenomenon that is a, a direct response to climatic variability and climatic shifts. We went from that 1940-1980 cool wet period uh, and the biggest thing that determines tree growth and survival is moisture. And I'll show you another data set from the Black Hills uh, a little later on that really 
points that out very strongly. So what's happened is we had that cool wet period and uh, conifer forests uh, receded successfully over vast periods of, of or la vast areas of space and they become much more expansive. But also within them, uh, they're, they've gotten a lot denser in there as well. And this is just the phenomenon of moisture on, on these sites. What, what moisture does and, and how climate, climate does things. Now other things, uh, grazing that reduces grass competition helps the trees. Uh, certainly fire suppression played a role. Um, how big a role is depends on where, okay? But uh, I, I think the climatic trend was uh, by far the biggest phenomenon there. So where are we now? Well, this is uh, the latest um, um, water supply stress index that's put out by the USDA indicating you know, where, where, where are the most water stressed areas. And this is based on uh, relative humidity and evaporative demand as a result of it, uh, soil depth, uh, soil moisture, soil water holding capacity. And so of course, California Central Valley is in severe trouble. Um, and you know, as are other areas, when you look at the, the Northwest Montana and Idaho, and uh, well, we're pretty neutral. Well, again, um, you always have to look at where the data comes from and how it's created and all of that. And yeah, a lot of this stuff I think is based on pretty good, pretty good measurements. The problem is that the soils of the Northern Rockies are poorly mapped, uh, very poorly understood. You know, we, they, they map them based on, on visual characteristics, not water holding capacity. And so this neutral for the Northwestern Montana and North Idaho is more of a reflection is uh, they're clueless. They don't know. Okay, it's not that there isn't water stress out there. There's tremendous water stress out there. It just has not been measured and monitored to the level as it is in the agricultural areas of California and the more po high populated areas. Okay, so you always have to look at these things. Uh, okay, where, where is it from? Who did the measurements? How did they do the measurements? All of those types of things. But it shows that, yeah, westwide, we're in a pretty dry trend. Now, let's look at the NOAA forecasts. And I... I did this presentation, I started putting it together several months ago, as I mentioned at the request of, uh, of Northwest Management. So this is February, prediction for February 2016 from NOAA, and this is temperature, and so it shows that uh, pretty much we're going to be 60 to 70 percent uh, warmer than normal. Well, we're at the end of February, and yeah, I think they were pretty close on their prediction there. And likewise, if we look at moisture, uh, we're going to be somewhere in the 60 to 70 percent uh, below normal for moisture for February. So, yeah, they're right on, okay? It's always nice to have hindsight and look back. So now if we look more into the future, uh, so here's, here's February, here's February, March, April, uh, showing not much changing, both with temperature and, uh, and moisture. So, you know, I hear people say, well, let's wait till the big snowstorm, you know? When's the next snow big snowstorm gonna hit? Well, according to Noah, there ain't gonna be one. Okay, we might get rain, but uh, the trends are warm, you know, and we might get a snowstorm, I'm counting on it, but the snow probably won't stick. It won't last very long, okay? And so let's go even further. Uh, this is the two-year outlook. So here we are again, uh, this is June, July, August of 2016 temperature. July, August, September, September, August, September, October, uh, September, October, November, through December, through January of 2016 into December, uh, or into February, and first, very March, April, do we start seeing a cooling, uh, getting down to a little bit uh, colder phase that we're in, okay? So that doesn't bode well for this summer, okay? And then the next winter, next spring, uh, December, January, February, uh, we should have a pretty good winter next year, okay, temperature-wise. Well, let's look at, and all this stuff is, findable on the internet. It takes a while to get it. it. It's not real evident up there. And Noah's gotten really reluctant to put these out because they don't want to be shown, have people say, oh, you were wrong. Okay, so for a while they were only putting out two-month forecasts. They used to put out five-year forecasts. They stopped doing that because, well, they were losing credibility. But the further <coughs> into the future you get, the more error there's associated with this. Okay, let's look at moisture. Well, <coughs> March, April, May, uh, here we are. Uh, Texas is supposed to get water, uh, not us. So we're dry, dry. Now, next summer, for moisture, it shows neutral. Okay, neutral is a scientific word of saying you don't know, okay? Um, and then, 
uh, September, October, October, November, we're supposed to start getting into a wetter phase again, okay? Warmer but wetter. So all predictions, long-term predictions, and uh, like I said, I've been tracking NOAA weather forecasts for about 15 years now. In the last five or six years, they've been pretty good. I mean, really, I mean, they really have, I mean, the capabilities have really increased in their ability to model and predict this stuff. So the outlook is a summer like we had last year. Only it's going to be worse because the soil hasn't been recharged. Okay, remember that cumulative effect of drought. So I'm, I'm very worried about this summer. Um, you know what, mid elevation snow is gone, um, and it should be here until April. Uh, high elevation is again, if it's normal, okay, but that's only part of the picture. So um, next summer could be scary, and I already have planned. Uh, we have 20 acres of forest. Um, I have some additional fire hazard reduction work I'm doing on my property uh, now. Uh, there's a few spots that aren't quite where I want it to be because uh, this next summer uh, has potential being worse than last summer. And the only thing that saved us last summer uh, from a 1910 level of event is that our fire suppression teams have gotten very good. I mean, DNRC has learned what to do, how to do. They had trucks and crews stationed everywhere and they jumped on everything and put it out as quickly as possible. So last summer for Montana, um, that we came off relatively unscathed compared to Eastern Washington, uh, was due to our fire suppression capabilities. But it, in those conditions, it only takes one to get out and blow up really big. And see, Eastern Washington, North Idaho has been spared a lot of stuff that we've had <coughs> over the last decade because they're a little wetter, except for last summer. And they got hit really, really hard. So, um, so there's the kind of the long-term, you know, drought, how long is it going to last? We have another summer to deal with this and things can happen. So we'll go back to the, the big picture of things again. Uh, you know, what does this all mean in the, in the bigger picture, the context of things? Is it global warming? Uh, what, what's going on here? Uh, there are many, many diagrams that show reconstruction of <coughs> past climate out here. Uh, this one kind of shows uh, an average, it, it, it's consistent with most of the other ones. It depends which author you look at. If they're really big and do climate change, uh, human-caused climate change, um, this tends to be flattened out a little bit more. Um, I, I prefer to go after the ones of historical, uh, that are based more on historical information. And this one actually coincides with some research I'll show you later on about our vegetation patterns. So I, I think this one's kind of on there, though, once again, this is a solid line. It's, you know, remember, there's a lot of variability depending where you are. So it's also log scale, logarithmic scale. So this stretch right here is 8,000 years. This stretch from here to here is only uh, 2,000 years, and this is the, our, last, our last century. So it kind of compresses it to show the old, overall picture, but what's important here, to me at least, and also supported by some of the research uh, done here in Montana, is this first 8,000 years was warmer and drier than we are now. Okay, and then we went into a cool wet period and then we hit the medieval optimum. That's when the Vikings landed in Iceland, Greenland and colonized it. And then when we came out of the medieval optimum about 800 years ago, uh, most of the Vikings on Iceland, Greenland died uh, just because you couldn't grow stuff there anymore. And by the way, 75% according to historic records, 75% of the European population died right here. Crop failures, everybody moved into the cities, crowded, dirty, fleas, bubonic plague, okay? And so, and here we, we came out of, the, out of the mini ice age, as this is called, uh, somewhere in the early 1900s, all the way up to 1980, depending on who you want to talk to and who wants to define when we came out of it. Um, but this has real significance on our forests because working across the Northern Rockies for, for decades, you know, you look at those forested landscapes and I at least, and you know, I thought I'd received pretty good education, graduate school, et cetera, thought, well, these forests have been there for 10,000 years. But, you know, as I look at this, and I'll show you some other data, actually they haven't. The forests that we see out there have only been there for 800 years, okay? Now, we had forests out here, but there are small pockets of trees here and there across the landscape. And the expansiveness that we see now has only developed in the last 800 years, or, whoa. The beginning of the ice age. 
Uh, well, I hope, I, hope uh, I didn't lose it. My projector just went dead on me. Uh, I hope our bulb didn't burn out. Now, I do have a projector in my office that I can quickly try and hook up into here. You were just saying there, does that show up in that huge tree ring that's out here? This, these trees are 550 years old. Well, no, the, the great big one is maybe downstairs. Well, these are actually bigger than that one. Oh, that real big one. It goes back um, to the clay. Yeah, that's, um, <coughs> it might, but there's a lot of things that affect uh, tree rings on this. Okay, this is very bad. <laughs> this should not happen at all. Um, okay, everybody take a, a quick breather. I'm going to hook up a different system. <laughs> sit down now I forgot what I was talking about but um, <laughs> point is that um, last 800 years our trees have our forests have been developing and so when you think on it from an ecological and adaptive uh, uh, perspective 800 years for forest ecosystem is nothing if your average tree gets to be two to three hundred years of age before it dies uh, that's four generations of trees. And so we often <coughs> assume that the forests that we have out there are these highly evolved adapted systems where the plants, the understory plants, the wildlife, and the trees have been interacting with each other for thousands of years and they've kind of uh, worked themselves into this finely tuned organismic type of concept where everything is highly dependent on everything else. The reality is 800 years in an evolutionary and adaptive concept context is a blink of an eye okay and so the bad news for some is no it is not a highly coordinated system that is highly dependent uh, where everything is dependent on everything else it is a opportunistic loose conglomeration of species that happen to grow where they happen to find a spot uh, at the time okay and that means that these are very robust forests they're used to change okay they're they're they are adaptable. They do change to different circumstances. Now, there are parts in that that might play where you have species that don't migrate well, okay, and that are being blocked by migration because it used to be no big deal for a grizzly bear to wander across the Bitterroot Valley, and now more than likely is going to get hit by a car or shot by somebody as they go across, okay. So these are certainly, there, there are concerns and things we have to think about there. But, um, you know, the point is that uh, um, things change and that our forests, as we think of them, oh well, um, are highly adaptable and these are young ecosystems. Okay, so, moving on. So, but again, uh, let me go back again. <laughs> this is a simple line and average and 
bear in mind everything bad I said about averages, okay? It's great for understanding these long-term trends, but if we look more specifically uh, towards southwestern and northwestern Montana in a short period of time in the last century, what we see as far as hot days, and so days above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees C, uh, we see that uh, there's a lot of fluctuation in here. And again, here's that 1940 to 1980 period. Uh, uh, so we had hot days in there as well, even though it was a cool, cool stretch in there. Uh, there's been a, if you want to say there's a trend, there's a trend like that. But statistics is always where you start and where you end in your data sets. So say if I started my data set right here in the 1920s, well across the 1920s, there's not a whole trend there, is it? It looks pretty neutral, okay? So we have this cool period here in, in the early 1900s. Now, likewise, northwestern Montana, we see much less of, a, of that effect than southwestern Montana. Uh, in part, southwestern Montana is dry. Dry air fluctuates in temperature more than uh, wet or humid air that's a little bit more northwestern Montana. And again, we see this trend. But you see this variability in here. And so what we're seeing here is weather. And if there's a trend, we would call that climate. And so you see all sorts of graphs, most of them showing that across the last century, we've been steadily warming. But again, it depends where you start. And if I took this graph back to here, uh, it wouldn't be that much, but if you put it in the context of the last uh, 800 years of the mini ice age, well yeah, of course we're warming. We're coming out of the mini ice age. Um, so we have to take that into account and we can look at other, break it down different ways. Uh, so here's spring maximum temperatures, spring minimum temperatures, and again, we, uh, uh, develop a regression line to that. Uh, so we see a, a gradual increase in that it's not getting as cold by one or two degrees as it used to be. We still see some pretty cold peaks or dips in there. And same thing with warm temperatures, summer. Uh, winter is where we might see the biggest effect uh, where we're not getting as cold as frequently as we used to. But again, if you put it into that bigger context of these longer term trends, um, this should not be unexpected. Okay, this is uh, a small picture of a bigger trend that we're seeing out there. But for us as forest managers, uh, what are the things we need to worry about that if we have a warm winter and a warm summer, we're gonna have a bad fire year. Okay, so that's kind of how you, how you put these things together. Now, just to emphasize that point, Here's another climatic uh, reconstruction made out of uh, um, uh, eight or seven or eight different data sets from different studies. Uh, Michael Mann is, again, the one who's done most of the physics work with, associated with global warming. So here's that medieval optimum again. <coughs> and this is for the Northern Hemisphere. So you can see that uh, uh, if it was uh, super hot in one spot, uh, maybe Finland, uh, it was actually not that hot uh, in Washington. Uh, so there, there's, to make an average line out of there, out of this is, is uh, quite, a, quite a leap uh, to present the concept. What the shading here shows is error associated with all of these. So if I take this average right here, what were the, the, the peaks and the valleys? And um, again, I, I point this out because it is the maximums and the minimums that determine species distribution, okay? One really cold winter is really going to uh, wipe out the warmer adapted species that have crept into high elevation sites. One really hot summer is going to kill the grand fir and the subalp that's moved out of the riparian areas and kill the subalpine fir that's moved down in elevation. Okay, and so those are it's those, those those variations, those maximum variations that that have make that big difference that's out there. Uh, this is that data set I want to show you of the Black Hills now. Black Hills climate is not impacted by Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's impacted by the Gulf of Mexico uh, air masses coming up uh, across uh, Colorado. So, a little com complex stuff going on here. We'll start at the bottom. What this is across the Black Hills was an extensive study where they aged the different cohorts of trees growing there. And what they found are these pulses of recruitment. So, from 1750 to 1800, um, in that 50 year stretch, there was a lot of tree regeneration, successful tree seedling establishment, okay? Likewise, in uh, 1720 and 1630s and, and all the way the further back you get, the little harder it is. 
what this squiggly line right here is, is temperature and precipitation, okay? <coughs> and what really correlates extremely well is when we have, the black line is precipitation, so when we had a lot of moisture, we got a lot of regeneration. Regeneration, peak in moisture. Regeneration, peak in moisture. Now, it's not with every peak in moisture. Here we have a peak in moisture, not a whole lot. So what's going on there? Remember, seedling recruitment is based on seed production. So trees producing a lot of cones and seeds. Rodent populations, because a high rodent cycle, and they will eat every single tree seed that falls on the ground. Um, and potentially fire. Well, these are fire years where fire scars were found on multiple locations. These were all different transects and different locations. So you can see this was a bad fire year because there's fire scars all across the Black Hills. And the fire years actually occur when there's low precipitation. Here's the documented 1750s drought. So what it really shows is the forest that we see out there is not this continual adding of seedlings. And you know, as a professional forester, I, when I worked for Boise Cascader Champion, they always be chomping the bit that, oh, we have massive seedling failure this year. We're not meeting our mandate of restocking our lands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the reality is that, uh, that you can't just thump a tree seedling in the ground and expect it to grow out here. You have to coincide it with the weather events that are here. And like this year, if you're going to plant seedlings out there and the predictions are we're going to record drought, Unless you provide them with water or significant grass and weed control that creates a pool of soil water for them, they're going to die. Okay, and you're wasting your time, and your money. Um, with the people that I work with in windbreaks and shelter belts, I'm advising them this is not a good year for putting in a windbreak or shelter belt unless you have an alternative water source. Okay, now that doesn't help our state nursery sell its seedling inventory, but you know it just it's the reality of things. So what we see out there is very closely tied to temperature and moisture. That, that occurs across these landscapes. And for a forest landowner, if things don't work out for you this year, realize you may not have done anything wrong, it's just you got, you had some bad luck that's out there. Okay, now this is another, um, some of the most pivotal work that's been done across the Northern Rockies uh, in the last century, as far as I'm concerned. Kathy Whitlock out of Bozeman did this. And what she did is collected lake core sediments out of various lakes across Montana. This happens to be Tally Lake up out of Kalispell. And so the cool thing about lake cores are, and this is, represents a timeline back uh, 13,000 years, that every spring with snow melt, you get a sediment deposit pulse into the lake. Okay, erosion occurs. And in that sediment, you get pollen that gets deposited in there. So if you age those sediment cores based on uh, events, flood events that are recorded in history, things like that, you can calibrate it. And then in each layer of that sediment, you take a slice and you put it under a microscope and you count the number of different kinds of pollen you have in there. So for example, this is pinus, uh, so all pine species. Pine pollen is hard to tell apart from other pine pollen. So limber pine, white pine, ponderosa pine, lodgepole pine, the pollen all look so similar, it's hard to tell it apart. So it's just pine, okay? And probably down here, it's more limber pine, um, and up here it's ponderosa pine and lodgepole pine. But uh, that's speculation on my part, but what's really cool in all of this stuff is if we look at something like, you think of Kalispell, what's the most common tree species in the Kalispell area? Douglas fir, okay? It's a very common, very robust species. It's everywhere. Well, that's Sudasuga, and that's combi they combi combine it with larch because Douglas fir and larch pollen look similar. Well, the width of the bar tells you how much pollen was found. Okay, the gray is just an amplification to amplify how much was there. And what you see here is you go back timeline that Douglas fir, based on pollen, was a minor component in the Flathead Valley until about 2,000 years ago. So think about that. And remember that, that graph that the first 8,000 years of the Holocene was hotter and drier than it is now. Okay, so if it was hotter and drier up there, we ought to see what more up there? Sagebrush, right? You think of Kalispell as sagebrush country? No. I don't. Well, sagebrush is Artemisia, right here. And look at that, we go back 2,000 years ago, and you know what? there are pulses <coughs> up here and there, pockets of it, but really, um, it disappeared 2,000 years ago when Douglas fir started making existence. And prior to that, it was a common species that contributed pollen to Italian Lake. Okay, so 
this is when I, early on when I showed you that uh, Holocene graph, okay, uh, where the first 8,000 years were warmer and drier. And some authors won't show that. They'll say it was actually cooler and wetter. Well, based on the pollen analysis that we have across the Northern Rockies, indeed, if we take indicators like Artemisia or Poaceae's grasses, okay, look at all that grass pollen that was up there. So the first 8,000 years of the Holocene Optimum, Kalispell was a grassy area devoid of only pockets of Douglas fir and mainly a savanna ponderosa pine or limber pine ecosystem. That's not what it is today. Okay? It's a productive, conserved wet forest ecosystem up there. Okay? So that, to me, this was some of the most pivotal research, as I mentioned, because it really shows what was going on. And when I look at these graphs, I don't know who to believe it or not, but when I look at the vegetation that indicates warm, dry, and I lay that on top of the climatic reconstructions, this is a way of truthing which of those climatic reconstructions represents reality. And so there you go, a long explanation. This, by the way, is fire right here because charcoal gets deposited. And what's really interesting, we see fire varied a lot depending on which of these climatic episodes you were in. But the last 2,000 years again, we saw fire really become more prevalent. Well, that probably also coincides with the heavier use of fire by Native American people at that time. You know, because this was rough country to live in. I mean, there weren't a lot of people living up in there, probably. And so the last 2,000 years, uh, as things uh, uh, um, moderate a little bit more moisture, more species diversity, moisture, more grasses, more elk, uh, et cetera, uh, we saw more Native American activity, and they burned a lot. So uh, anyway, so this is kind of how we can kind of come back to what was there what is the normal variable background fluctuation, all this stuff? Again, it, ecologically, when I look at a forest and I look at changes, and I want to interpret what do those changes mean, I want to compare that to what is the, the normal variation and change over the last climatic stable period, which we call the Holocene, the last 10,000 years. All right, so now let's go back to our predictions of what's, what's in store for us for the future. Well, on all these climate models of where things are supposed to go, so the green bars are 2020s, the, the yellow bars are 2050, the blue bars are 2070. And so if we look at California, for example, uh, they're predicting that annually uh, moisture is gonna slowly decline. Uh, winter moisture is gonna be fine, but summer moisture, April through July, spring moisture is gonna be really, really low, okay? It's just gonna continually become less. We look at <coughs> Eastern Washington, and what we see is moisture um, is actually going to increase. And we look at uh, central Montana, Milk River, and moisture is going to increase. So we hear all the time that we're in for worse fire years. Remember that Forest Service prediction right at the beginning? Fires are going to become greater in some areas it's, and, and those types of things. Well, the climate models, if greenhouse gas theory is correct and moving us in that direction, we're actually going to get wetter up here. Okay, warmer but wetter, and and but those are just interesting to see what different predictions and different science and different modeling is is showing. Now, let me be uh, add complexity to all this. Okay, greenhouse gases is one thing where the physics is there that shows if you add greenhouse gases, it traps heat escaping the earth and re-radiates them back to the earth. Okay, that's what CO2 is supposed to do, right? Uh, and, you know, that's pretty straightforward um, on the surface. Now, the complexity of global circulation, and you get these plumes of CO2 in certain areas and less in other areas, it's much more complicated than that, okay? But at least in theory, the physics seems pretty sound on it, and I don't have an issue with it. The problem is, I don't disagree reading all that stuff that the greenhouse gases are having an impact but what I don't know is how much okay because we're luck talking about changing one percent one tenth of percent of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere okay so and co2 is four tenths of a percent of our atmospheric gas okay the Sun is something that a lot of people ignore even though for me you know this is a primary uh, thing to look at because that's where we get our energy from, okay? And so just like the burner on your stove, greenhouse gas <coughs> theory says if you have your burner on the stove at a constant temperature and your pot of water has reached an equilibrium, 
Uh, if you add some salt to it, it's going to change whether the water boils or not. Okay, that's how greenhouse gases work in there. Uh, so solar physics says, okay, this is we're going to mess with the burner itself. Okay, so you know, here's a picture of the sun, and I throw in there. Uh, this is actually uh, the different magnetic waves that are associated with the uh, sunspots and solar flares. You know, the sun is anything but a uniform entity. Now, there's all sorts of weird stuff going on there uh, that we don't normally read or hear a lot about. And to put it in perspective, um, uh, well, forget there, the sun also pulses. It goes on an 11 to 13 year cycle, okay? Um, and that looks pretty spectacular. But when you look at the energy output, uh, 1,366 watts per square meter per second, that's called the solar constant. It's called the solar constant because the sun's output, on average, does not change a whole lot. Okay, there's that average number again. So when we look at this, however, and these different lines are, blue line is sunspots. The number of sunspots are equivalent to energy output. More sunspots, more energy out output from the sun, uh, which is related to solar flares. So the green line is solar flares more solar flares and get more energy pulses at the Earth. Uh, so this is all how this is correlated. And again, this is the variation around that solar constant, which isn't just a, which can be three to four watts per square meter. Okay, a watt, you know, think of a 60 watt light bulb. And, and you think about, okay, if I change that from a 60 watt light bulb to a 61 watt light bulb, is that really gonna make a difference about uh, on the temperature in the room? And you know the notion is well no I mean that's so it's within the noise of things, but you also have to think about these solar flares and these maxes and minimums that occur there. You know that one big solar flare that hits the Earth can put a pulse of energy into our atmosphere as well. And to put that into better perspective, you know there's our Earth and water is this big absorption buffer for energy, so looks pretty impressive. It, you know a lot of energy there to change it. Well, let's put that into perspective to the sun and solar flare. There's the Earth to scale to the sun. Okay. Now, changing this output from this beast by one to two percent uh, suddenly becomes a little bit more of a, a realistic conception of what impacts that might have. And this is one solar flare compared to the Earth. Luckily, we're off a long ways further off than that. Otherwise, we would have been toast a long time ago. But also consider that in the uh, in the uh, um, I want to call it Space Lab. Um, the habitat circulating the Earth right now with our, with our astronauts in it. They have a special room that shields them should a solar flare be directed in our direction. Because there is so much gamma radiation and X-ray and everything else coming off of that solar flare that if that hits astronauts in our outer atmosphere that are not in a specifically shielded room, uh, they will be turned into toast. Okay, so that really, you've got to think about how much energy is hitting us, and a lot of it is being deflected by our magnetosphere, you know, the, the gravitational um, uh, circle, or the gravitational field of the Earth, but, um, so the, the sun is a pretty big thing. And uh, let me put that more into perspective. So we have these 11, 13 year old, 13 cycles that occur, and so this was the last one, a peak that occurred in 2001, 2002, and then this is the one that occurred in 2013-2014, and uh, it's correlated to sunspots. Now, if you read the solar physics articles and journals on all this stuff, they monitor the sun and movement, their circulation within the sun. They call it, a, their jargon is it's a conveyor belt, a plasma conveyor belt. And when you get a combination of a lot of sunspots and solar flares and this strong circulation of plasma in the sun, uh, that is historically a very, very, very strong uh, indicator that the sun is going into a quiet period. You get this burst of bacteria, activity, and then it goes into a quiet period. And so, when and this can be reconstructed because of isotopes that are created by solar radiation um, on the Earth, beryllium, and things like that. So this is the last 400 years of solar activity. So here's where we were in this last century. Gee, I wonder why things were warming just a little bit. Okay. And we go back to what is called the Dalton Minimum, based on the person who discovered this phenomenon, this phenomenon and the Maunder Minimum, that are, caused a real dip in the mini ice age uh, since the medieval optimum. Okay? So here we are now, and because of this conveyor belt and the way things are going, there are some significant predictions that <coughs> we are going into something analogous to a Dalton, or even potentially a Maunder Minimum, though, you know, again, uh, there has to be some caution in this because there's a lot of uncertainty involved with all this stuff. 
But if we look at one of these correlations again, the blue is the correlation of the atmospheric temperature of the Earth, and this is with solar activity. And so you do see when there was a Dalton minimum, we had a cool, wet, cool period and a moderate minimum. You know, that was pretty hard times uh, for folks. By the way, 1800, go back in history. I also read history a lot. What was significant about 1800 to 18, I think it was 1805, 1806, 1812. Does that ring a bell? 1812? Ever hear of the 1812 overture? Yeah. That's when Napoleon got hit by one of the hardest winters in Siberia in history, which led to the complete collapse of Napoleon's armies. Right there. Oh damn, I wish he would have had, he probably wished he had solar physicists talking to him at the time. <laughs> okay, so I am not presenting this as a counter to saying greenhouse gases and all that stuff is not true. Uh, again, there is some sound science and all of that. But uh, what I do uh, like to, oh, let me go back, not where I want to go. What is very interesting to me that if we do go into the super quiet period, it looks like we're on the way. First of all, there's a delay effect, okay, because there's, you have all this heat, it has to kind of dissipate a little bit off of it. They're predicting that this minimum is going to be 2025, right around there, okay. So if the solar physicists are correct, we're going to be going into a cooling period. So as I've told my greenhouse gas uh, uh, colleagues, you know, that are uh, fire and brimstone greenhouse gas advocates um, as part of the impacts, the next 10 years is going to be extremely fascinating. Because if we continue in a warming trend, to me, that adds some real credibility to the physics behind greenhouse gases. On the other hand, if we go into a cooling phase, you're going to see an awful lot of scrambling going on. Okay? So, you know, me, I'm building a wood pile that's going to last me a while. Um, okay? <laughs> because, hey, if I don't need it, great. But if I need it, I want it to, I want it to be there. Okay? So, you know, this is... We talked about, okay, when you see this is what happens when you ask me, what's going to happen with the drought we're in right now? Okay, we're now into solar physics. Okay, but it is complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on here that we need to think about. Now, there's another whole process, and you're dealing with cosmic radiation, that as our solar system goes through different arms of the Milky Way, we get bombarded with more background cosmic radiation, which ionizes our atmosphere, which causes more cloud cover. And there's a real strong correlation between that and our past climate. So there's all these pieces that are affecting what's going on with our weather and our climate trends, and it's complicated. And of course, when I tell that, I've got one person particular, a faculty member at MSU, uh, that I don't get along with real well. He's a political science guy, and he's just, no, global warming's here, and we need to start telling people to do this X, Y, and Z. And I go, it's complicated. He goes, you don't understand the science. And that kind of just, OK, we're done. <laughs> so. Uh, so Uh, that's a piece of history I don't know about. So that would be, yeah. I mean, there. You think about those things, and you know, it, it's it's pretty cool stuff. And even you know that that 40-year cool wet stretch in the 1940s to 1960s. Didn't you all grow up hearing your parents say, you know, when I went to school, I had to walk through three-foot snowdrifts? They did. I did. Okay, <laughs> it's there. Okay. <laughs> Well, if things get cooler, more moisture, you bet. These are the trends. I mean, it's temperature and moisture are interconnected because the hotter it is, the lower the relative humidity, the more the water gets sucked off the, off the land. And interestingly enough, uh, photosynthesis of C3 plants, which is what most of our native forests and, and plants are made up of, ma is maximized at uh, somewhere between uh, uh, 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. At 94 to 96 degrees, respiration, that's the way we operate, but plants do that too, okay? That's how they stay alive. Respiration exceeds photosynthesis. So anytime it's warmer than 95, 96 degrees, our forests are actually net producers of CO2, okay? They're polluting the atmosphere, so to speak. And so, you know, temperature is a, is a big player in that. So our for long-winded answer, our forests grow best at temperatures between 70 and 80 degrees. 
okay? They don't, they stop growing at 95 degrees. They start losing at 95 degrees. So, so that's a, another complicated way of saying yes, okay? All right, so we get back to what does this all mean to us and what can we do about this? Um, and, and you know, I, I, I like to look at big picture stuff, but then it's, uh, as I said earlier, how do you relate that to whether that uh, oak tree in my backyard is going to grow or die? Should I chop it down and plant a palm tree? You know, and, and truly, there are there are folks. You know, I get this thrown at me. I've got colleagues in Minnesota saying, "Oh, we're planting trees from Indiana up in northern Minnesota uh, because of climate change." And, and yeah, good luck with that. Okay, uh, so um, so we think about these larger impacts of uh, again this low pressure up here. Um, at, we have this massive high pressure from uh, um, El Nino, uh, this low pressure up here that's been sucking that warm up air up into uh, the northwest, okay? And if that is a high pressure that changes, okay, and th so this becomes a, a, a La Nina, or an El Nino, or La Nina, I'm just mix them up, a La Nina, and Pacific Cale Oscillation, we have a high pressure, that then pulls that cold air down from Canada into Montana, okay? That's, Simplistically, but quite on the money, how this how this works. So we have cool, wet summers and hot, dry summers. Okay. So what what real impact does that have? So we go back to this. Uh, you know, here's the, the northern Rockies, Missoula, and our major impact is from this wet Pacific here. That's where we get our moisture from. Okay. Pretty much it. Uh, Black Hills, eastern Montana. As I mentioned earlier, it gets it from Gulf of Mexico weather that, that hits this, and actually, Gulf of Mexico impacts very strongly the eastern half of Yellowstone National Park. So um, I often thought someday I'm going to climb up on a ridge somewhere right here and have one foot in the Gulf of Mexico and the other in the Columbia, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, weather patterns. Um, when we think of how those influence things, uh, we look at our forest types and really to the left of this red line we have this huge impact of Pacific moisture uh, where we have western red cedar, grand fir as a dominant species. I mean, grand fir is just a, a dominant species, and, and most of these forest types are grand fir cedar habitat types out on, on this side, north Idaho, etc. And as soon as we cross that magical line where the continental weather has a bigger impact, then our wettest species is really Douglas fir. And we have these dry dug fir, ponderosa pine, higher elevation lodgepole pines like uh, in, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, and subalpine fir at, at higher, higher sites. We even have remnant white spruce populations in some of these island mountain ranges. I mean, these, these places are just absolutely fascinating because they're these little time capsules of 13,000 years ago when the glaciers retreated. You have original species cohorts that are just in these little pockets out, out there. So how does that, you know, what does that mean to all of us? And how do we look at that? Well, as I mentioned early on, we have this big climate picture, which I'm now done with. Um, and let's move on to more of the local scale. So topographic position and soils. Well, northwestern Montana, some of our most productive forests. Uh, uh, there's a picture from, uh, I think, Mount Henry up in the Yak, uh, looking across these really productive forests. Um, and we've got to think about you know, how these weather patterns hit these mountain ranges, uh, what air, Pacific air hits the mountain, gets raised up, you get a lot of condensation off of it, rainfall, and then it goes over the top, and now it's devoid of moisture, and as it moves down the valley bottom, it recompresses. But without that moisture, um, its thermal capacity is different. So actually, when that air recompresses, it heats up more than it was before. It heats up at about 5 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 foot elevation change on there. A prime example is Lolo Pass. Powell Ranger Station is in a cedar forest type. You drive up over Lolo Pass and subalpine fir. By the time you're down Lolo, you're in a ponderosa pine forest. That's exactly how this happens. And so this is the impact of the topography on these landscapes. So on the wetter side, you know, you might have a grand fir forest, uh, shade tolerant species, and dug fir, and, and larch, and ponderosa pine, the overstory. Uh, so really a lot of vegetation growth on there. Um, subalpine forests that hold these deep snow packs and, and lakes and things like that, all dependent on that ample moisture. Uh, lodgepole pine is its own ecosystem, okay? Lodgepole pine has this relationship with fire. Without fire, lodgepole pine doesn't exist like this. Okay, it needs that fire to kill all the other species, and it's the only ones whose seeds survive. And it, that's how it creates these stands uh, like this. But then you get into the dug fir forest ecosystems of central Montana, where they are really restricted out of the valley bottoms, too dry down here. There's an amber alert going on, so it has a cell phone. 
Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, I thought someone was really trying to sabotage my talk. <laughs> uh, anyways, we have low, ele low elevation timber lines because trees start to occur at a minimum of 16 inches precipitation in the soil. Okay? So it might rain or get that much here, but it evaporates off, doesn't make it in the soil. So you have a lower tree line, and then you have uh, tree lines associated with aspects, so southwest slope to hot and dry. You get these northeast eyebrows of trees out on there. And you think about it, this tree line and this little seedling growing there, you see it's growing in this little swale where there might be some moisture and there might have been a gopher hole there that restricted grass growth that allowed that seed and that seedling to survive there. But the more you get on that other slope, the, the less the chances of survival. So you think about it, if we go into a prolonged drought period, what's going to be impacted here? It's those that are most on the fringes of this, right? So. Uh, these edges that are most exposed, you're going to start seeing in really ratty trees and, and, and problems associated with that. Now on the wetter sites, go back, go back to this, it won't be as obvious. But what you'll see first, and I see it on my own property, is your most drought intolerant species like grand fir is going to fall out first. And in the last 10 years, I have a repairing bottom, I should say we because my wife was in here, no, she left. Uh, okay, but. <laughs> We have a repairing bottom and we have grand fir that has spread out of it. In the last 10 years, it's all died back. Okay, I have a few left down in there, but most of them die back uh, on them. So here you'd see individual species starting to suffer, but other species survive. So it's all in the gradients that you see out there. Let's go forward. And so you get in the drier sites, and then even uh, here where you see it to the greatest scale, um, you know, this spot gets just the same moisture as that spot does. This is southwest facing, so it dries out. Most of that moisture evaporates back in the air, and this makes it in the soil. So here you have Douglas fir, and here you have limber pine and juniper. Okay, showing you that it's strictly a moisture gradient that's associated with temperature across that, that landscape. And then finally we get into these dry ponderosa pine sites, bull mountains. Uh, the last 10 years, the bull mountains has looked awful, awful ragged, okay? And they've really been suffering from drought stress in those trees out there. So, and uh, all of these systems, it's all about moisture and air temperature. Um, a century ago, a German scientist by the name of Walter, last name, created these climatographs. Where this is precipitation, and this is temperature, and when you have this period of higher temperature and lower precipitation, what this reflects is low humidity. So when the air has a greater capacity to absorb moisture, then there is moisture ready to fill it. You have this, what's called summer drought period, okay? Salt Lake City, which is analogous to us. Here's uh, Astoria, Oregon, probably one of the wettest places on Earth that I'm aware of. And you see that maybe a week in the end of July you have that, where, the, where it's not 100% humidity and wet. And then you get over to the Midwest, where I grew up. Uh, well, the capacity of the air to absorb moisture never exceeds the moisture that's available, which is why the humidity is always 90 to 100% and you're miserable all summer long in Wisconsin and Minnesota, okay? Uh, so it's really this relationship that defines any ecosystem. And I can look at one of these graphs and tell you what kind of vegetation you have there, even if I don't know where that graph is from, because this, is, this tells it all. So one of the big moderating effects on this atmospheric relationship between moisture or precipitation and temperature is soil. Okay, so all this sponge that holds the water can moderate drought periods. Okay, and uh, this picture I have here is Mount Mazama ash, that fabled ash cap soil that makes North Idaho so incredibly productive. And it's just, it holds water, it's, it's pumice basically, really fine pumice. It's nutrient deficient, but in places North Idaho, it's uh, three, four meters deep. And it's just, it, all the water, all the snow that melts just gets hung up in there. And the trees have that as a big reservoir. It's like having, uh, having a petunia that big uh, in a 20 gallon pot, okay? That's what that ash cap soil does. And so I can go on a ridge top. You know, I'm very I've spent many years in North Idaho. This is a ridge top. And for goodness sake, I've got Western red cedar growing on this ridge top, okay? And this is because this is growing on uh, about 10 feet of solid ash cap soil, okay? Same latitude that we're at. So now, if I go 150 miles to the east into central Montana from this spot, that's what I have. 
the biomass is the same. The amount of vegetation growth is the same, but when I look at the soils, that's what I have. I have six inches of soil on rock. Okay, so there is no buffering capacity there anymore. So, and because of central Montana, lower humidities, but um, even if I get a three foot snowpack on this forest and it all melts in the soil, most of it's gonna come out in the streams because it can't hold it. So um, soil is a huge moderator. And so when you are examining your property, for example, even on our 20 acres, you find spots where trees just seem to grow really well. And chances are, if you dig a soil pit, you have a, you have a big pool of soil and a rock depression there that's holding the water and that's why the trees are doing well. And you have another spot where the trees, no matter what you do, just grow crappy. Okay, you have tight rings, regeneration fails, uh, even your understory vegetation might change uh, from something like a twin flower to bunch grass. And it's because you have no water holding capacity in the soil. And our soil maps that you can go on to now for forest landscapes are completely inadequate. They're non-existent, okay? They draw a big line along a, t a topographic area and say, well, this is what you have. Well, you know, that's kind of like drawing a line around Missoula and say everybody drives Fords, okay? It's, it, it's just, it, it's, very, it, it's very inaccurate. So when we look at these landscapes, and this happened to be Flesher Pass during spruce, bu uh, spruce budworm outbreak, you see, and you see this commonly, okay, why is this tree doing fairly well, and why are these trees around it just being hammered by spruce budworm? And why is this patch not being impacted, and that patch up there being impacted, and look at these trees right here. Why is that happening? Okay, so now you can ask me, well, how bad is the drought stress? Well, if you're that tree right there, it's not too bad. Okay, what's going on here? And a lot of this is probably due to soil variability, particularly these larger patches in here. Okay, now this stuff in here is probably closely associated with genetic variability and adaptation to the site. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, species vary, as I mentioned earlier. So this is Ponderosa pine root system. So there's a reason Ponderosa pine does well on, does better, I should say, on poor soils. Ponderosa pine is their fastest growing species on good soils. Okay, the mills don't necessarily like the wood that much, but nonetheless, it's a really good growing species. But it can grow on dry soils because it produces these uh, fantastic tap roots that find a crack in the fissure and find a water source until you're in successive years of drought and that fissure of rock in the soil, down in the ground has run out of water and then the trees start also tipping over on you and, and looking poorly, okay? And that's where cumulative effect comes into. Now compare that to Douglas fir, okay? This is a big Douglas fir tree and you see it doesn't have a deep, deep root system at all. It can, it's an intermediate root system and you know there's some soil here and there's rocks, in the, uh, uh, rocks underneath here and the surrounding Ponderosa pine are doing really well. This was actually a landowner's whose property I helped them with. And I cored all these trees and the Ponderosa pine had been sent thin twice before this. And all the Ponderosa pine trees were still showing some pretty good growth and the Doug Ford all shut down. And that's because the Ponderosa pine was drawing water out of deeper fissures in the rock and the Douglas fir was unable to get it. And so species makes a difference. So if you're going into a dry period, selecting for the species that avoid the drought better. Doesn't mean we didn't get rid of all the dug fur on there, we just discriminated against it. We want species variability on that site because what happens if we get a mountain pine beetle outbreak on here and it hits all of Ponderosa Pond. Okay, I want to have some dug fur uh, as a backup on there. So we get into, okay, species and genetic adaptability. Um, how does all of that stuff work? Well, first of all, a little basic refresher on tree physiology. The way all trees work, is right under the bark is the cambium that grows wood to the inside and what we call phloem to the outside. The wood's purpose is to transport water up to the needles. Just a bunch of straws um, and the, the wood that does it is alive, it's called the sapwood. And the width of that sapwood is directly proportional to the number of needles in the overstory that need that water supply. Okay? You don't want to keep more sapwood than you need because you have to feed it. And if you don't need it, you let it die, that becomes a hardwood. The phloem underneath the bark, its whole purpose is to transport sugar from the needles down to the rest of the tree and the root system to keep it alive. That's how this, the plumbing and the physiology of a tree works. Well, uh, this is an aspen that I sectioned uh, 
just for demonstration. So here's the sapwood. It's in live tissue. The phloem is right underneath the bark. This is a dead a branch that died, created a dead stop. When water moves through a tree, it's almost always under tension, under suction, because you have that low humidity that sucks the water out of the needles, that transfers that suction to the sapwood, that transfers to the root system of the soils, okay? So when you have any kind of an obstruction or a puncture in that water system, just like with a straw, it doesn't work real well. So you see this zone of dead tissue, but when this twig or branch died, this sucked in air, embolized, and became non-functional. Okay, this is why proper pruning is really good, but it plays a bigger role here because this is now an obstruction for water moving up. Okay, and so the more water stressed a tree, what happens is, uh, I can't really show it on a picture, but when a tree is really water stressed, these straws in here break. They get air pockets in them and they become non-functional. We call that xylem embolism, okay, that occurs, or cavitation. And the problem with that is when there's no water moving up, there's no water pressure to move the sugars down, okay? And so here's some really cool, uh, I'll skip that one real quick. A, a couple things, and maybe I won't skip it. There are a lot of moving parts on here. This is a grand fir that I topped many years ago in order to prevent water loss because I didn't want it to die. I wanted it for a shade on a metal tree, and my wife didn't like it because, as she said, it looked ugly. But uh, it, it worked, it stayed alive for another eight years or so, and then it finally died too. But what you really see is um, the, the roll that the branches, these live branches, see up here that died back. But this is the sapwood that this living cambium produced. And it produces sapwood from the sugar that these surrounding branches fed it. Okay? And then underneath here's the phloem that, mo that moves it up. And again, this, because it has a small top, originally when I cut it, this was all sapwood. Once I cut the top, all that sapwood died and only that much stays alive reflect that living top. But as trees get older, this is a 411 year old larch, okay? That's all the sapwood that's there. As trees are older, they become photosyn their photosynthesis slows down. It's not fully understood why it does it, but it's just like us, we slow down. Our growth rates slow down, maybe, what is it, our DNA is degrading, God knows what, okay? But they just don't grow very well and they go into what's called a maintenance mode. They just produce enough sugar to keep themselves alive, but not enough to really grow well. Okay, so small sapwoods, small ability to move water up to the crown, which means less water available to move sugars down the crown and into the stem. Now, where this plays a real big role is there's always been this theory. Does a water stressed tree die because when it's water stressed it can't photosynthesize and therefore it can't produce sugar? Does it, so does it die from starvation? Or does it die from just not having enough water? I mean, this has been a fundamental question plaguing uh, physiologists for a long time. Well, Ana Sala is a physiologist here and she did some really cool work where she looked at tree heights. This is the same tree. This is at uh, open circles. Uh, this is the non-structural carbohydrates is what that means, so sugar and starch that's not in the wood or lignin, um, available in the tree uh, phloem and, and xylem tissue. So at two meters above the ground, this is the level that's there. And 57 meters above the ground, this is what's there. So it's about a two to three reduction, and it varies by time of year. So it's really high in the spring because the tree's putting on, it's mobilizing all the sugar to put on new needle growth, right? Makes sense? That's why when you tap sugar maples for sugar, they're moving all the sugar for growth, okay? And then it drops down again. But it was, she noticed is there's a higher level up in the crown of the tree than, than in the base of the tree, which makes sense because the crown is where the sugar is produced, so there's a higher amount there. But when she looked at, and I'm just going to skip by here a little bit, when you looked at height and water stress versus no water stress. So this line right here, these open circles, are when the tree was not water stressed. And you see that by height, the carbohydrates are in this uh, fatty uh, tissues, or here's uh, carbohydrates, that when the tree is somewhat watered, that, very, that concentration doesn't vary that much, but when the tree goes in drought stress, the tree starts to concentrate its sugars in the top of the tree because it lacks the ability to move them from the top of the tree down to the bottom of the tree, okay? So why is this important? And it's just one of the same, is when we look at trees uh, uh, and what's killing it, it finally answered that question. The trees are not starving to death by any means. It's a double whammy. One is they're drought stressed, so they're still photosynthesizing, they produce all the sugar, but it can't move anywhere. And so it sits in these tops of these trees that are water stressed that become a superior food source for caterpillars, 
defoliators, bark beetles, because all of those cannot digest wood. They cannot digest cellulose, they cannot digest lignin, which is what wood is made out of. What they're after are the carbohydrates that are in the wood, the sugars and the starches. So when a tree is water stressed, what happens is the top of the tree becomes a super food source. It becomes a baby Ruth candy bar to all of the bugs, insects, and diseases that want to attack and feed off of that tree. And so when we look at these things, historically we look at it from the perspective is, well, what kind of bug is chewing on my tree and how do I get rid of it? The problem is not what kind of bug is chewing on your tree. The problem is the tree is water stressed and therefore it's becoming a super food source that can't defend itself to insects and diseases that are out there. Uh, and so when you see these types of things out there, I mean, I'm always looking at crowns of trees and you go, well, why does that one look nice? And why does that one look like that? It must be some kind of pest or pathogen. And if I get rid of the pest or pathogen, I solve my problem. No. The problem is that this tree is severely water stressed and it can't move its goodies around in the tree. And it becomes a super food source that can then infect other trees. Same reason on these big ponderosa pines, Ips likes to hit the top. Well, yeah, it can't defend itself and that's the best, best I mean, this is Jaker's and down here you're eating McDonald's, okay? So it, it's, uh, it's a different way of looking at the trees, but it's pretty interesting stuff. So crowns are everything, and in periods of drought stress like last summer, I mean, it, as I mentioned, I'm always looking at the tops of trees, okay? And because they're an indicator, this one's having some severe problems, and chances are it's drought stressed, and it can't move its carbohydrates down its root system, so its root system is starving to death and dying, so now it can't transport enough water to the top of the tree, and so now the tree's losing needles because they're all dying of drought stress. And then eventually, someone's gonna come on and eat this thing, and what's eating it isn't the problem. So, uh, just question yes. though, but there are trees right next to it, not six feet, not six feet away, that are that are doing fine, and, right. and, and they're apparently not water stressed. Correct, and it's just like nature is a cruel master. Um, you have the ones that get all the goodies and the ones that don't. Okay, so if you could yank this tree out and look at its root system, and yank this tree out and look at its root system, and uh, so I look at a lot of root wads when they're putting in roads. It's a great learning opportunity. Many root trees may have roots all off to one side. This one might be sitting on a big rock somewhere. Now, there are other factors. I mentioned genetics, okay? This one might be predisposed, genetically predisposed to issues. And that's a huge another topic that I could spend a whole hour outlining uh, for you as well. So, yeah, there's many things. Um, this might be... At, Douglas fir particularly tends to self-pollinate, so that inbreeds and you get all of these things that uh, these inherent genetic weaknesses will be exhibited on the tree. But you look at the crown of this tree, you know, it was doing pretty well and now all of a sudden, bam. And so when you go into, like this summer, longer periods of drought stress, you want to be walking through your forest and looking at which trees the tops are looking bad on. Because they're telling you, I'm the one that's going to be the first to fail and look at the ones that have good tops. And so when there's drought stress in a situation, you might want to, this is an opportunity to tell you, that tells you what you can do. And this is those question marks, what can I do? Um, also be careful, you know, this is common with Douglas fir, shallow rooted. You can create drought stress. Soils, root system, Douglas fir is a shallow root system. You open this up, particularly on the south and west slope, you're suddenly getting full sunlight on the soil surface where it used to max out at 70 degrees, now it's 130 degrees, it dries it out, that shallow root system gets roasted by the sun, and almost always when I see a dug fir stand open up like this, you get these kind of crowns, and with 10, 15 years, they're all dead. Okay, so you gotta think about the physiological limitations. Now, ponderosa pine and larch that are deep-rooted can tolerate this. Douglas fir, grand fir, cannot. They'll always fall apart on you, particularly southwest slopes, northeast slopes, you can get away with a little bit more because you don't get that direct sunlight on, on the soil. So, and we see this across natural landscapes. The bigger older trees are less efficient and they're just on maintenance and a little bit tips them over and they start failing on you. And so, oh, well, there's a, a Doug Furby lot break in there. Well, actually, you have an extremely drought stress stand and the Doug Fir is finding a really good food source right there. So, and in some cases, it may be the pathogen or the pest actually has gained a foothold. Now, oh, I'm just going to really quickly uh, go over something else here uh, that you might want to think about in management, and that is it's all about water, right? And 50% of our water comes as snowpack. 
All right, so and we're seeing that now, snowpack's coming out. So one of the things I've been tracking for quite a while now is snowpack retention. And actually there's some folks that have worked on this for a long time. So here's a dense closed canopy dug fir stand. And this is an opening in that dug fir stand, taken this time of year. And there's two feet of compacted mini glacier snow right there. All right. Well, it might not seem like much, but this is an additional three to four weeks of snow, which might make the difference of whether that tree is drought stressed from July, August, and September, or just drought stressed August and September, which will affect its ability to move its carbohydrates around, defend itself, particularly when pests and pathogens are active and flying around and attacking trees. So managing snowpack is something we really need to think about a lot and maybe uh, a big future uh, component. And so here's another thin stand versus uh, a closed canopy stand. Uh, you see this all the time. Now a fellow a researcher out of Colorado named Trendle looked at this uh, intensively for his whole career and did some really fascinating work. This was an entire drainage that was set up just to study impacts on snowpack. Uh, on here. And we have something very similar, Tenderfoot Experiment Station in central Montana. And there's a big flaw with this study, because he was just trying to create openings of different sizes in the checkerboard. And that flaw is he didn't think about wind. Okay, And so what he did is he created wind tunnels. And in this study, it, the results were all over the place because the wind would get in here and blow all the snow from the openings out into the surrounding forest. And it just, you know, messed up his entire study. Uh, rather severely. But there, this is many other studies in this uh, arena. And so on this drainage, what he found is uh, here's uh, 1940s to 1955, here's 1956, after he did that, 71. And by opening it up, all he found is the snowpack melted earlier because of more sun, not shading from, from, from the trees. But subsequent studies, and we use the same type of work in wind rigs and shelter belts, where we try to collect snow with wind, um, that's not what we want to do in a forest, okay? We want to keep the snow dispersed. And so here's some other studies that showed uh, <clears throat> before and after. And so this one study here showed no impact. And this study right here showed a 30% uh, increase in stream flow uh, from the area where you had openings and you collected snowpack. And uh, this is one of my favorite ones where you had two drainages side by side, one of which uh, <clears throat> had harvesting, one of which did not. And what it showed is the harvested unit right here, the shaded is the difference between non-harvested and harvested, or this was before and after uh, as well, showed that in the spring you got a deeper snowpack, in the summer negligible impact because they were looking at stream flow, they had uh, uh, flumes measuring stream flow, in the summer negligible impact, well, and these are rainfall events up here, <coughs> this makes perfect sense. Because in the summer when the soil is dry, it rains, the soil absorbs that moisture, it doesn't go through the soil into the stream. Right? It gets absorbed. And then in the fall, after prolonged rainfall period, soil gets saturated, and at some point it starts to contribute to the stream again. So you saw stream flow increase. Now I've looked at a lot of these different studies, and on average, got an 11 to 12 percent increase in water yield in the streams after selective harvesting to increase snowpack. So specifically, how do you do that? I mean, if you're a forest owner and you're looking at your own property, oh, by the way, this is another study where they studied it first, calibration period. Then they put in roads. Just the roads themselves showed an increase in snow yield uh, and water yield. And then they did different treatments. And uh, the different treatments, the openings, uh, increased uh, their snow yield by almost 30%. So just another one of those data sets. So here's the, here's the real interesting stuff is, how do I went, avoid wind problems? What's the size of my opening that's ideal for collecting snow? And this was really cool to me because um, a separate area of research is wind breaks and, and, and wind breaks and shelter belts. What? How do you get effective wind speed reduction? So what they found is, if we look at the diameter of the clear cut and the maximum impact, <coughs> where the diameter of the clear cut is determined by the height of the surrounding trees. Okay, it makes sense for wind dipping down and sun and shading effects. And what they found is <coughs> the maximum effect. Let's look at this one. Of snowpack increase occurred when that opening was as big across as the surrounding trees are tall. That's a one, okay? And that snowpack held all the way to about five times the size of the trees around it, okay? Because once you get bigger than five times the height of that, the wind starts to dip back down and blow the snow off the site. Now, this is really valuable because in, snow break, in wind break and shelter belt, 
If we want to protect an area, the height of the windbreaker <coughs> shelter belt, the area that's protected is five, ti five times the height of that windbreaker shelter belt. So if we have a 20 foot tall trees in our windbreaker shelter belt, we can expect 100 foot protect wind protection after that, it drops off dramatically as the wind dips back down. So exactly the same phenomenon, same numbers and measurements, only a totally different line of research, which again gives it some robustness and some value to understanding that. So as a forest landowner, if I want to create openings and add snowpack, keep snow on my property, it can make a big difference. I want it to be typically, typically um, at a quarter the size of the height of the surrounding trees. So if my tree is 60 foot feet tall and I only create a 15 foot opening, my impact on snowpack will be negligible. If I create that opening one times the size, so a 60 foot opening, I will have the maximum impact of, of collecting a snowpack. If I create that opening five times as big across as my trees are tall, then I'm going to start seeing diminishing returns and potential negative impacts because the wind's going to dip down and blow it into the surrounding forest, which if that's what you want to do on the leeward side, that'll work as well. So some, some pretty cool stuff that we can do as forest landowners if we're going into this drought trend. And so I just throw this out here. This is where I live up my row. Uh, tribal forestry has created these openings because of historic uh, recollection of the elders that this was more open and had a diverse forest. There are many reasons for doing that, but uh, um, by doing this, they're actually <coughs> increasing the yield of their snowpack. And this time of year, I can go up on any of these sites, and these openings, if they're shaded from the sun, have three feet of snow on them, and you get under the tree canopy, and there's none. There's no snow. Okay. So we really need to start thinking about storing moisture in our forests. Now, if the solar physicists are correct and we're going to a cooling period, well, you don't have to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. But again, I, I have, cannot with any certainty uh, or confidence say that the solar impact is going to negate the greenhouse gas impact or who's right or who's wrong on it. But, you know, I, as a pragmatist, I want to kind of look at all these types of things and hedge my bets. Uh, and so, um, and we see this, you know, here's a thinned area, a uh, spruce budworm outbreak, and uh, certainly a very visual difference there. And it boils down back to moisture, carbohydrate production, movability, storage, local environment, genetics, uh, and, you know, the impacts that these trees have on their surrounding environment. So, lunchtime. Okay, and I went, I went over, sorry, we had technical glitch.